The commonest way that people interfere with sarcoids is by doing idiotic things with them. They put toothpaste on them. There's a, there's a particular type of toothpaste which has an amazing reputation for helping sarcoids. It simply doesn't do that. They consult with homeopaths, they consult with the internet, they try to get information and, and uh, heal all selves on the, on the internet. There's no such thing. If this was as simple as that, we would have no skin cancer in any species of animal. And why is it any different from a fibrosarcoma on a person to have a sarcoid on a horse? Well, it isn't any different whatsoever. It is exactly the same circumstance. Here's one that, that is uh, on the outside corner of the eye. So this is the eye here, which you see, and this is on the outside corner of the eye. And again, this is a tumor that was very badly dealt with, started out as a small tumor, got something off the internet, started putting it on. Of course, the next thing is it's bigger, so they don't, they panic and they get more of the stuff from the internet or they get a stronger form or they get something else. Um, I, I, I don't like rubbish from the internet. Sarcoids have a remarkable uh, a, a event every now and again. About one in a hundred cases, actually probably a bit more than that in Sweden, interestingly enough, uh, it's up to 10% of horses actually spontaneously clear their sarcoids and those animals that do that, and when I mean spontaneously clear, I mean every single lesion, not even one left behind, those animals will never get another one. And of course, that is a very interesting thing from our perspective. And we're trying to find out why that is, what these animals do in order to resolve the condition. Because what they do is what we have to try to make other horses do. And if we can force the issue like that, we will land up with a, with a very, very much more hopeful long-term outlook to find an immunological method of treatment. But in a, in a word, it does happen and it happens more frequently than people think. So quite commonly people put something on uh, and then they say, oh yes, that resolved the issue and he never got another one. Well, he was going to be a self-resolver. For the most part, it wasn't what they put on that resolved it. It was him upstairs or at least nature. Uh, unfortunately, as far as the sarcoid is concerned, there are 40 different recognized sar uh, sarcoid treatments that are available on the internet. Every single one of them will have successes, but every single one of them will have failures. Any, tr any treatment that tells me that it's resolved 100% of cases is clearly um, either an N number of one or two, or it's a lie. It just simply doesn't happen like that. Uh, you cannot do that. We've treated now 48,000 cases through our sarcoid service now, uh, and we know that there are cases that resolve. Of course, those are the spontaneous ones. But otherwise, we, we have to recognize that there is no treatment that is guaranteed success in every circumstance. That means that we have to try to tackle this from a normal oncology perspective. So we need to do chemotherapy of some description, uh, or we need to do surgery. So, of course, the first kind of treatment is a surgical approach. And there are a lot of different kinds of surgical approach. Uh, there is a, a variable outcome from those, depending on the size of the lesion and how much margin you can get. So, of course, that is dependent upon the site, the location, and the type of the sarcoid that you're dealing with. So, if you have a really nasty sarcoid in a really nasty place, surgery is going to be constrained and you're probably not going to manage to resolve it. You should remember, I think, at this point, that every single treatment that has a chance of success has to get rid of every single solitary cell. And therefore, when people go and have cancer treatment, the first thing they cut the piece off, then they give you some chemo, then they give you some radiation, then they give you some more chemo, then they give you some more radiation. Why is that? Well, that's because it's very difficult to find the last cell. And we have to get that last cell out because even if you leave one cell behind, it's coming back as two, it's coming back as a new tumor, and usually it's coming back spitting mad. And then you have a problem because you're shifting the paradigm right the way through to the malignant or fibroblastic forms of the disease. So you can see that where there are constraints on any treatment, you, you are going to have recurrences and we have to expect that. So the surgical options 
there are many of them. People commonly use laser surgery, they use sharp surgery, they use diathermy, they use photodynamic cryosurgery, all these kind of treatments which are actually surgical approaches to it. Sometimes people even ligate them uh, with a rubber band or with some horse hair or stuff like this. I mean, 90% of those is just so ludicrous and so rubbish as to be unbelievable that people would do that. How would we feel if we went to the doctor with a cancer on a hand and he got out a piece of string and tied it round it and said, go home? We w I think we'd be, we'd probably be upset because... Seeking a second opinion, perhaps. Yeah, absolutely. We would be seeking a second opinion. We probably wouldn't go back to see that doctor again, and quite rightly so, because that's just simply not medicine. It's not the appropriate way to deal with this disease. Then we have a number of non-surgical approaches uh, which can be done, which involve topical applications of materials. There's a lot of those out there on the internet, uh, and some of them are available from veterinary surgeons, and some of them are just freely available. Uh, and uh, and you know those are effective under certain circumstances. And each of those six types that we described earlier on has its own basic requirement for surgical excision, or for chemotherapy, or for radiation or immunotherapy. So, so you can't just treat a sarcoid with a cream that worked last time? No, no, you can't do that. Uh, what you have to do is to consider each lesion in its own right. What are the constraints upon success? What is the likely extent of the lesion? So that you give it the maximum chance of getting rid of the last cell. It's that last cell. The first cell is nothing. The first million cells is nothing. The last cell is the issue. You have to get rid of the last cell and every single treatment that you apply has to be dedicated toward that end. And that means that you have to keep pursuing the disease. So if you're applying chemotherapy, just like they do in people, you have to go back and have some more. And you have to go back and have some more, and some more, and some more, and some more, until eventually you get to the point where it's gone. The treatment has to kill uh, normal adjacent cells in order to buy a margin. And we do know that in the case of a sarcoid, that margin needs to be a centimetre or preferably a centimetre and a half or sometimes even two centimetres in some locations where you have to buy extra because you're dealing with the leg. So if you imagine that this is the normal side and this is the tumour, we've got them growing like that. And so we have to kill right the way out to here and that means we have to kill normal tissue alongside. And if we do that, it's going to be painful and it's going to be upsetting for the horse, it's going to be probably poorly tolerated uh, and so the second time you come to treat them or the third time you come to treat them you just land up with a horse that doesn't like you anywhere near them. Of course it is. I mean uh, it's exactly the same in a human. I've been treating my hand here for cancer uh, and it's very painful, very painful. Not the cancer but the treatment is very sore. Horse owners unfortunately expect us to have every single sarcoid resolved in one hit. I think it's completely unrealistic, it's completely unjustified, and it's completely uh, wrong to expect a one-off cream to rub on cancer. If I had a cream to rub on cancer to make it go away, I certainly wouldn't be working for Liverpool University. I wouldn't be working for anybody. I'd be employing half the world, because everybody wants something as simple as that that gets rid of cancer even if you do the most sophisticated treatment and you don't resolve the issue with your first hit and then you decide to stop, we know that 85% of those cases, and that's a figure which we're going to publish, uh, will be exacerbated by what you do. So in other words, the lesions will get worse when you do this. They won't get better, they won't stay static, they will get worse in 85% of those cases. So you have to be prepared to pursue the disease. And given that you can't resolve everything first time off, you have to, you have to say, well, how are we going to resolve them then? What are we going to do? Well, we're going to pursue them. And we're going to combine treatments. So the surgical treatment, then the chemotherapy. And then we've got an interesting group called the immunotherapy, which is very interesting because if we can make the body do something immunological to get rid of the tumor, we will have a solution to the problem. Just like those that spontaneously resolve, they do something spontaneously that makes the condition impossible to develop again. 
Uh, and that's the important issue with it. So immunotherapy is one of the things we are targeting for the future as being a means of controlling the disease. And so that's what we, we hope to be able to deliver in due course. It won't be in my lifetime, I suspect, uh, but it will be in somebody else's lifetime. Uh, and that's good. And then finally, we have the last end, the last treatment, which is the ultimate treatment, which is radiation treatment. And we do radiation treatment here. Uh, it's very expensive, inevitably. Um, it costs the same as in humans. So it's the same treatment. Why should it cost any less in a horse? In fact, it should cost more because the horse is bigger and it needs more. So, it, but it doesn't work out like that, unfortunately. Uh, and horse owners uh, and the general public don't see that that's an important issue for us. So ultimately, I think radiation is the gold standard against which all kinds of treatment have to be measured. Uh, and if we, if we reckon that radiation is well over 90% successful, uh, then of course everybody says, well, I'll have the radiation then. There's a problem with that. Uh, and that is that we can only deal with very small tumors at the moment with the radiation that's available to us. We don't have the same enormous facilities for radiation treatment that the humans have. We don't have any of those, uh, certainly not in the United Kingdom. There's one center that's got a little machine that does some of it, but it's very restricted to those lesions on the face or on the distal limb of some description. Here's one around the eye, and you can see that there are constraints around the eye as well. So you've got ulcers, ulcerated sarcoid here, and nodules here. But for the most part, you can see this skin is very markedly changed, and it runs right the way down to the eyelid margin. So of course, if we put chemotherapy on here and it gets into here, it's going to kill the eye. So it's constrained. This is, needs a radiation treatment. This needs radiation brachytherapy. So that's what that needs. And if it doesn't have that for a cost of... 10,000 euros or 8,000 euros, well, we can try, but it's not going to work. So it's very disappointing when they get to this size. It's extremely bad and very disappointing. Just as, just as in any species of any cancer, the smaller and the earlier the tumor is, the better the prognosis is likely to be. That is something which we understand in the human. We look at our bodies regularly, hopefully all of us in our own particular kinds of ways, uh, and we check for things that are going to go on. And when we find something, we pounce on it very quickly. So that's because we understand the importance of early intervention, which is swiftly followed by an aggressive form of treatment. Not just going down to the supermarket and buying some anti-cancer cream, which you can buy off the shelf, because there isn't such a thing. But people do that, or toothpaste. I mean, it's idiotic, isn't it? You know, if you've got cancer, you certainly wouldn't do it for yourself. So why on earth are you doing it for your horse? That's the issue, isn't it? So if we get the concept of very early, very aggressive intervention ingrained in every single horse owner's mind, we will be in a much, much better position to deal with this disease in a positive kind of way.